we uh, been doing this series on women, and, and I just had this idea last night. I know all the women are sending me offerings. <laughs> so one, somebody wrote me last week and said, it was, actually I've been getting, I told you this last week, or whenever I was here last. <laughs> I don't know how, I'm here all the time, so I can never tell when I'm, that I've just been getting like really hundreds of great emails and Facebook stuff and last week someone told me though that I I was really hurting the culture because I was allowing women to cut their hair and work out so you just need to stop that okay because you're you're cutting your hair and you're working out and that's masculine what they said I'm really serious so they said I had the power to change that so I just did my part right there just stop okay. stop cutting your hair Stop working out to becoming masculine. <laughs> you have to. Never mind. <laughs> no, no. I caught myself. Never mind. That was good. I'm getting wiser. So, um, anyway, I had this thought last night. I was kind of just thinking through. Um, what today would look like, and I thought it might be awesome to have Kathy come up here and share. And uh, so we're going to do that for in just a minute. I I, I want to just give you a few scriptures before she comes up, and just in case she says something about me, <laughs> just warm you up. <laughs> this is for you, honey. Proverbs 18.22 said, he who, finds, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Hey, guys, you want to find favor from the Lord? Find a woman. That's scriptural. It's in the book right there. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. That's why I got married. I needed more favor with God and I had everyone lay hands on me and I'm like, I just need to get married. <laughs> that part's not really true, but I have favor with God because of my wife. And uh, Exodus 20, verse 12 says, honor your father and your mother. You've got to honor your mother, right? Okay, no, that wasn't very deep. But um, Proverbs 31, why don't you turn there before Kathy comes up and I just want to just um, go through... A few of the attributes. This is interesting. The words of King Lemuel, the oracle his mother taught him. I looked up uh, Lemuel. I don't know if that's how you say his name, but it means beloved. No, it means devoted to God. And most people believe because Proverbs, because the book of Proverbs, chapter one says these are the Proverbs of Solomon, that actually it was a nickname for Solomon, that he was devoted to God and it was one of the names of Solomon, which would mean that um, it says the words of Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him, which if it's true that this is Solomon, it would mean that Bathsheba taught him these things. And here's what she taught him. Oh, my son, oh, my son of my womb, oh, the son of my vows, do not give your strength to a woman or your ways to that which destroys kings. It's not for kings, oh, Lemuel, to, or for... Or is it not, I'm sorry, is it not for kings, Olamu, is it not for kings to drink wine, for rulers to desire strong drink? It is not for kings, it should say. They will drink and forget their decree and pervert the rights of the afflicted. Strong wine, give strong wine to him who's perishing and wine to those whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of the unfortunate. Open your mouth and judge righteously and defend the right of the afflicted and the needy. An excellent wife who can find her worth is far above jewels. This is something that Solomon's mother taught him. <clears throat> the heart of her husband trusts her, he will give her, he and he will give her no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flock, and she works with her hands in delight. She's like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She rises while well, it's still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength 
It makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches forth her hand to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hands to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen and garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She smiles at the future and she opens her mouth in wisdom. And her teachings are the teachings of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise and bless her. Her husband also, he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you have excelled them all. Charms deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her, let her works praise her in the gates. <clears throat> That's uh, awesome. You know, my mom, we're going to tell... We're going to tell some stories tonight. Kathy's going to come up and we're going to move this pulpit and put a couple chairs up here and just tell some stories. But my mom, when I met Kathy, and I'll let her tell some of that story when I met her, but she ended up at my house and she was 12. And my, my mother had a name for my girlfriends that wasn't positive. We weren't Christians. And I had forgot something at the lake where I met Kathy. And so she comes to the door. She was 12. I was 15. And uh, she came, figured out how, figured out, figured out my address. She lived in a in another city about 30 miles from where we lived, and she figured out our address somehow through a friend, and ended up at my house bringing me whatever it is that I had forgotten at the lake. And my mom answered the door and invited her in, and they talked for a little bit, and I came out of my room and we talked, and she gave me whatever it was I forgot, which I don't remember what that was. And when she left, my mom turns to me and she said, now that's the marrying kind. <laughs> my mother had never liked one of my girlfriends. She said, that's the marrying kind. I said, mom, she's 12. I'll never forget this as long as, my, as I live. My mother said, I don't care if she's 10. That's the marrying kind. <laughs> it's funny that the, the king's mother taught him these, this Proverbs 31. My mother taught, my mother shortened it down to just, that's the marrying kind right there. <laughs> See all these attributes right there? Yeah, that's the marrying kind right there. Just marry that woman. So I did. and <laughs> We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, I love this uh, proverb, and I feel like Kathy has embodied this um, her whole life, actually. Um, I was just kind of thinking through this, what his mother taught him, that her worth was above jewels. His heart trusts in her, and I have. Kathy's my very best friend in life, and um, you can. I grew up in a very dysfunctional home, had girlfriends from the time I can remember. You know, I don't know what girlfriends meant. You know, we called it going out. But um, Kathy was the only person in my life who actually ever believed in me, and I would say that my attraction to Kathy was the fact that she believed in me before I did. And it says that her the heart of her husband trusts in her and she does him good all, all of her life and she um, in verse uh, 12 uh, verse 13 it says that she she is happy to work she's a hard worker and I, I just I think that this proverb is actually an embodiment it's like someone went into the future watched my wife do life and wrote a proverb about her it's true. She's, she, she's hard working. I love this part. It says that her lamp does not go out at night. And to me, that doesn't mean that she works all night necessarily. It means in the dark times of life that she still shines. That her circumstances don't dictate her stances. That she lives, she lives internally. She internally generates her joy. It's not internally, it's not externally generated. And and uh, we've been through a, a lot of times, and Kathy's been the stabilizing force in our life. And uh, um, it says that uh, she feels good about herself, and she looks to the future and smiles. And <clears throat> I love that because this, this Proverbs woman is a, a visionary. She looks to the future and smiles. I think that um, when your lamp doesn't go out at night, it's, pretty, it's a lot easier to look to the future and smile. 
You know, I think that uh, hard times come and go, and we know that every time there's a hard, there's, there's hard seasons, like for our country or for our city, <coughs> excuse me, or for our family, that um, the critics began to um, talk about how this isn't going to end and how bad it is. And I don't know, how many of you like sports? I don't know. Do you like some sort of sports? Yeah, well, we love sports, and, and uh, we watch uh, pro football and pro basketball. And I was just thinking about the Miami Heat. How many of you like the Miami Heat? <coughs> LeBron James. And they, uh, last year they just traded, that the Miami Heat just traded for uh, 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 all new players or a lot of new players. And LeBron James and, and Dwayne Wade and um, one, of, one other famous guy. So all these guys ended up in one team, ended up on one team. And... Uh, and they're just supposed to be this amazing team. And they lost like eight games out of 12 <coughs> when they started. And the media just started like, oh, just going, you know, writing all this stuff about, you know, what a disaster this, this was. And, you know, here they wanted to be together and they, they don't know how to play together and they're arguing in the, in the um, locker room. And they keep saying, we're not doing any of that. Like, we're just learning how to play together. And now it's like 30 games later and, I think they're like 22 and 8 or something. They have one of the best records in the NBA. They beat the Lakers yesterday. But it's so typical when you watch people, when you watch people go through hard times, the predictions that, that people around you have. You're not going to make it. Everything's bad. You made a bad choice. And we're so accustomed to things happening instantly in our life. We live in an instant society. You know, I mean, if you sit in line at, at Burger King for more than three minutes, you're like, and they call this fast food. <laughs> We're so accustomed to instant gratification and, and to things that happen right now. I mean, we would never make it in farming. I mean, we'd plant seed and go out three days later and wonder, you know, where's the tomatoes? And, and I, I think that we've lost so much of what it takes to actually have, you know, to actually have a life that's rooted in the kingdom and, a, and a, um, a marriage that actually perseveres through hard times. It's awesome what the king's mother taught him because he taught him to look for a wife, to look for qualities in, in somebody who could, who could stand in hard times, persevere in, in um, adversity, and be a light in a dark place. And, in, and it goes on to say that she considers a field and buys it and with her earnings, she plants a vineyard. And um, I, I just think that when we think about women in our culture, and I'm talking about in a church culture, it's easy to, you know, we've been talking about how easy it is to feel like in some way that, um, that they don't have the place that a man should have, should have. But even in the Old Covenant, the book of Proverbs is a book written in the Old Covenant. Even in the Old Covenant, kings were taught that women should be powerful, should be prophetic, should be, should be good with money, should be visionaries, should be encouraged and should be spoke about in the gates. And so um, what I want to do is I want to have Kathy just come up here. So I just thought that we'd just talk about our history. She's like, what are, we, what are we gonna talk about? I'm like, whatever you want to. She's like, no, no, give me something to talk about. So I thought um, we'd just talk about our history. Do you remember when we met? I do. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the good stuff. I wanna... Oh my goodness. Go ahead. I was only 12 years old when we met. She didn't which, look 12, though. She looked 18-ish. It's really she scary. She was beautiful in face and form. Who's talking, you or me? Oh. <clears throat> it's really scary now when I look at my oldest granddaughter and she's standing before me and she's 12 years old and I'm thinking what in the world did my parents what were they thinking it's like how could they allow me to do the things that oh uh, careful <laughs> this no, is I live just, you know 
so many times people ask me, what did, what did you think when you first met Chris? Did you like, did you, did you know you were in love with him? And I'm like, well, at 12 years old, I knew that I, as much as I could know that I was in love with him, that I was. I mean, I had known him for three days. <laughs> in that Jesus th was in the grave for three days. <laughs> Rose on the third day. Go ahead, honey. I'm Great things happened in three days. Yeah, exactly. I'll tell. I'll tell you. I'll tell you this story. When I met Chris, the short here, version. Here he was. Okay. This awesome, good-looking, young teenager that had a motorcycle. That's what it was, right there. Not only was it a motorcycle, <laughs> it was a Honda 100. Come on, baby. He almost didn't come to Clear Lake. You meet the nicest people on a Honda. Because of this Honda 100. But his buddy had a motorcycle too, and he decided, you know what? We're going to just go and have fun. So I had seen him just kind of wandering around camp, and we had gone, we had gone to Clear Lake for a year after year, probably for, I don't know, eight, ten years or so. No, not that long. I was only 12. Probably, <laughs> oh my goodness, probably six years or so. We had gone to Clear Lake every single year. So you have your kind of your camping family that you know. And all of a sudden, with Gary, there was Chris. I'm like, wow. He was a fun guy. I got so sunburnt laying out in the water watching him work out on a boat. <laughs> it was worth it, though. Couldn't go water skiing the next day, but... It looks like steroids, but it's actually Snickers. <laughs> go ahead, babe. Scoot a little closer so they can get us both in the picture. There we go. Our knees are touching. Is that close enough? So we have Chris, to fast forward so Chris, part. stop talking. Go ahead. Honey. So Chris, Chris went to my parents and he said, "I just got this bike, Mr. and Mrs. Talbert. Can can Kathy go for a bike ride with me? Motorcycle. And a motor, yeah, a motorcycle. Call it a bike. A motorcycle ride with me. And my parents are like, <laughs> yeah." So my hair was really long. I mean, my hair was like down to here. And I didn't have a rubber band, so I just got on the back of this motorcycle and off we went. Well, we had, we had so much fun. We went riding all back and forth in these old logging trails. And the thing that we, neither one of us heard was my mom and dad said, you had to be back in an hour. I swear, I never heard that. And he says he never heard that. It was about six and a half, seven hours later. We come riding up on this motorcycle. My hair by now wasn't down to here. It was like out to here. And I think half the camp was waiting to greet us as we rode in. And that was my parents' introduction to Chris. My mom was never so happy to see him leave. Well, that's right. Glad your dad didn't hunt like Bill. <laughs> but you know, something something happened inside. It was like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell. I don't know what to tell people when they say, "How do you know when you're in love?" It's like, I just knew there was something that happened inside. It was like, I just knew. I didn't know if I'd ever see this guy again, but I thought, I love this guy. I sat on the end of the dock for like three or four days after, and I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed because he had to leave. It was so sad. It was very it sad. It was so sad. It was really sad. But it was like, you know when you, when you passionately pursue something, you just go above and beyond <clears throat> to get what you want? Yeah, I found him. And he told there you a little I was, bit of the story. discovered. And then I supposedly forgot something. You did. Did you do that on purpose? I, no, uh, um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I still don't even remember what it was. I think it was a shirt or a coat or something. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. And then you ended up at my house. She did. And my mother talked to you. She did. Sweet she lady. liked you. Mm -hmm. So then we started calling each other. We did. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And then the next year, what happened at Christmas? Oh. These. 
I bought her he this. So... I bought her an engagement ring. She was 13. And I, I like, I, I, I worked full time. So I put it on layaway, and I worked all year. Put money on it every every week until I could pay it off. It was a pretty expensive wedding ring, engagement ring, wedding ring, engagement ring kind of combination. And then, um, so for Christmas time, I had it put in a can and sealed, like it was in a can, looked look like a can of corn. I had it sealed, and I worked in a warehouse, so I wrapped it in about 45 boxes. So it was a big old box, and every time you opened a box, there was another box, and another box, and another box. And, and presents along the way. And lots of other presents in there. And one of them was a can opener. One was. Yeah. <laughs> and so her parents were all there. I didn't ask them if I could proposed to her <laughs> I mean they could say no so I thought better to ask forgiveness than permission which I don't believe anymore that's not a kingdom principle at all I wouldn't do that but she's opening all these presents and all these presents and finally she gets down to this can and I'm like well that's what the can opener's for and I kept thinking this whole time I'm wondering if I'm going to get a ring. I wonder if I'm going to get a ring. But you know, the box was so big, and then it just kept uh, gifts and gifts and gifts. And he was already really extravagant. Anyway, he's always been so extravagant with Can't me. Can't help it. So I got all kinds of things in, the, in this boxes. I was opening them, opening it, and then I come to this can, and I'm like, well, I guess that's what the can opener is for. I never even heard of it canning a ring before. I never heard of canning anything except for peaches. So here I am opening up this can, and it's like, oh my gosh, my heart starts pounding and pounding and pounding, and I think my mom's mouth dropped open, and my dad's eyes got big, and... and... Then you open the can, and there was another box. There was, but... Three more, the... actually. <laughs> Everything that Chris does is always extravagant, over the top. So then when you finally got down to the... The ring. The ring. And what did you do? I cried. And screamed. Her parents screamed too, but <laughs> I think it may have had a different. They may have screamed for another reason. They loved you. Yes, they did. They, they were trying to figure out how much they loved me about that moment. Yeah. So. Uh, by the way, this is not a good idea like to get engaged at 12 or 13. It's like, yeah, yeah. So we went together for five years before we knew the Lord, before we met, I mean, before we got married. And no, for four years before we knew the Lord and last five year. years that yeah, we got, we found the Lord a year before we got married in this little youth group. So it was actually a big youth group in a, in a little house. There's about a hundred kids and as soon as um, I started seeking God, because I worked with this guy who was a Christian, and he was telling me, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. And he would pray for me all the time and pray with me. And I think I received Jesus like six or eight times. <laughs> I got counted a lot, I'll tell you that. <laughs> a lot of people led me to Christ <laughs> at different times. But it, nothing, I just didn't have any foundation in my life, you know, nothing didn't have anybody to, to guide me or, or and then of course you know my story, we, I didn't really have a father so nothing really stuck in my life, I really loved God, had an encounter with God real early and um, when I was 15 years old uh, my mother was really sick with psoriasis she had uh, psoriasis covered her almost her entire body and, and we also had a prowler at the same time so my mother was sleeping in the front room with a shotgun and I was sleeping with the 22, and actually the prowler came through my door, through my window one night, about one or two o'clock in the morning, and I woke up just to see, just as he got his one leg in my window, and I pulled out the, the gun and shot at him, and the police came, and it was a pretty crazy time. So um, about, I think it was maybe a week or two later, I was just, you know, I was 15, just scared to death. It was, the, it was actually the year I met Kathy. <clears throat> and um, I said, if there's a God, if you, if you heal my mother, I'll find out who you are and I'll serve you the rest of my life. And an audible voice said, my name is Jesus Christ and you have what you requested. 
which I didn't know there was a Jesus movement, but that was kind of common, Jesus movement, audible voices. And, and so then uh, the next morning, my mother was completely well of psoriasis. It was completely gone from her body, 100%. <laughs> They caught the prowler about a week later, and um, the, the voice came back about a week later. And the, the voice said to me, my name is Jesus Christ. You said if I healed your mother that you'd serve me, and I'm waiting. And so I have spent the next um, three years just really hungry for God. I remember I, I, was in, um, I, was in, I was going to high school. It was really, really, really uh, tough years in high school. Our school was one-third black, one-third Mexican one-third white and we had race riots so it was a very dangerous school we had police on our campus all the time and a very liberal school and I remember my my teacher uh, my science teacher actually my uh, my philosophy teacher got up one day and he started teaching uh, he was you know a big Freudian kind of fan and he was teaching that there was no God and I had had an encounter like a year before where a voice said my name is Jesus Christ and you have what you requested but I, didn't, I couldn't read. I read on the third grade level, so I'd never read the Bible. So this guy starts for like a half an hour just talking about there's no God and religion is something that's made up in the, in the mind of, of men. And, and he's going through this whole thing, you know. And so I, I'm sitting there and literally something takes over my body and I stand up in class, which was like totally not me, and I give this very intelligent discourse on the nature of creation. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about. And when I get done, I mean, I, I don't know anything about science. I don't know. Anything, and I'm giving this whole, like, this whole biological history on the, you know, this, is, this crazy creation idea. And, and I sit down, and the class stands up and claps. Of course, he flunks me, but. So I was really hungry for God. And, and I was, you know, just trying to draw Kathy into, you know, it was a God I didn't really know. I knew his name was Jesus Christ. And. He'd intervened in my life several times, and he'd actually saved me in a fight with an, an angel who actually came and saved me in my high school when a guy came to beat me up, actually had me on the ground, and uh, this really big guy picks him up, throws him against the wall, and said, this guy is my friend. Don't ever touch him again. I'd never seen that guy in my life. And he looks at me and says, if he ever bothers you, just come and let me know. Walks down the hallway about five feet and disappears. Yeah, that was my early days. So I was pretty hungry for God, and when I started getting closer and closer to God, Kathy decided that she'd become a nun. Actually, sort of. I was raised Catholic, baptized, went through communion and confirmation, and I was going to be a nun before I met him. And then nuns couldn't get married, which was a problem. That's why they're called nuns. <laughs> wow, you're a pretty quick thinker. I've never heard you say that before. <laughs> Remember that prayer I prayed that the Holy Spirit would be in most of everything we said? He gave me that. Maybe. So then we, we ended up at this home group and um, they, where they spoke in tongues and all this crazy stuff that I had never heard of. And my friend Steve Tuttle said, man, you got, I was working with him. He's like, you've got to go to this, this um, youth group I'm in. And uh, there's miracles there. There's all kinds of crazy stuff happening. I'm like, so he, he's one of the, those guys. He invited me like 10 times. And you know how you say, oh, yeah, you'll go just to make someone feel good and then about the tenth time he's like you've promised me ten times you're going you haven't come once I'm like alright we're going and Kathy's like well, if you're going I'm going so we go to this home group and there's probably I don't know 80, 90, 100 kids crammed into this house a small pretty small house two story but small house and we get in there and they're singing you know hallelujah we don't know that this is the Jesus movement we don't know that this is a we were part of the shepherding movement. We didn't even know that until 20 years later. <laughs> and so the, um, the man, his name is Ken Hughes, is leading the worship. And, and during the worship, people are standing up during the worship. This was kind of their style. 
they would, we would worship for about a half an hour, and while we'd worship, people would stand up and say, I was a heroin addict and Jesus freed me. They would just spontaneously give testimonies. And so when that, that kind of was winding down and music was still kind of going, just the guy playing the guitar and us singing like that in this cramped room, you couldn't even move in there. And the young man um, who was leading said, would, um, would anyone in here like to receive Jesus Christ? And I'm like, that's me. I need to do that. And Kathy's like, well, if you're doing that, I'm doing that too. So <clears throat> she raises her hand and he did, you know, the standard thing that you would do led everyone who raised their hand, you know, he led them in a prayer. I think we were the only two actually that night. And so we pray this prayer and, and then um, he comes over uh, like towards the end of the evening. Well, the, everything was still kind of going on and he said, would you like to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? And I'm like, baptism in the Holy Spirit would be good. What is, what is that? <laughs> He's like, well, you get a prayer language and you can do miracles. And it was just really simple, you know, just really... And I'm like, yeah, I think so. And so he, Kathy's like, no, if you're doing that, I'm doing that. So <laughs> they prayed for both of us. And immediately she starts, sha da da bo sha da bo da da She did that for months. And like, I didn't, nothing happened. They would pray for me every week. Like, I'd even try to like, you know, learn Spanish or something. Just to, <laughs> nothing happened to me. And she's like, oh, this is so awesome. Listen, I'm like, no, no stop this. I started this stuff. I mean, <laughs> and then while we're there, um, well, the first night when they, they pray for us and she receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and then he comes up, the leader comes up at the end and he says to us, um, you know, you just received Jesus. We're like, yeah, we got that part. And he's like, well, you're like two little babies and you need a father. I'm like, well, that makes perfect sense. And so he brings over two young men that were maybe three years older than us, like we were I was 18, so you know maybe he was 20 or 21. And uh, these two young men, and he says, well, which one of these two men do you want to be your father? <laughs> I'd never been to church before, so I'm like, wow, this is really cool the way they do this. <laughs> maybe they find your wife like this too. Here's my three daughters. Which one would you like to marry? So we just kind of looked at each other, and I'm like, we just picked the best looking one. We're like, we'll take him. And he became our spiritual father. You want to say something about that? No. We needed a spiritual dad. <laughs> we, needed, we needed help. <laughs> no, it was just, it was really awesome. And I just want to encourage all the, you know, the young people here and people who are just receiving the Lord or newly receive the Lord, attach yourself to somebody who can, who can speak into your life, who can have input into your life, who can watch over you, who can nurture you and help you grow. Because I look back to those early years and there's so many things that we, we learned and, and having somebody to partner there with us was amazing. We didn't know, we didn't know any different. We didn't then. know anything. We, we did not know anything then. And it was so awesome. I mean, Art and Kathy, they got married just a few weeks before we did. And the, the guy's name was Art, and he, married, he got married, and his wife's name was Kathy. Yeah, they got, they got married just a few weeks before we did, and she got pregnant just a little bit before I did, and we had kids together. And, and it was just was awesome, that just the, the input of having somebody spiritually over you that can walk through things with you, um, that you can talk to you that can help you through things it was pretty amazing um, probably about seven years ago now maybe yeah, eight, seven years ago probably seven years ago now um, Chris buried art he ended up going home with the Lord and it was a real um, it was a real honor just to be able to um, do that funeral you don't realize the deposits that people make into your life a lot of times until after they're gone, which is really sad. We're just learning how to treasure what God has given to each one of us. I know to Chris and I, to be able to treasure each person for the gift that God has given to us instead of having to wait till it's taken away. Yeah, and one of the things I'd really encourage you in is that uh, Art wasn't, uh, he wasn't much older in the Lord than we were. 
he was maybe a year or two older in the Lord than we were. And so it was amazing that we went to him for everything. Um, not because anyone required it, but just because we didn't know anything. And we didn't know the Bible. We didn't know anything about life. We both were obviously raised in pretty dysfunctional homes. So we would call art for everything. We're like, what do you think we should do about this? Or like, if we were going to buy a car, we'd like, do you think, is this okay? Like, and he would just like, yeah, uh, well, well, let's pray. His answer was always, well, let's pray about it. He taught us like to pray about everything. We prayed about, you know, sh- should, we, should we put new fixtures in our bathroom? Why don't we pray about it? <laughs> and, a little overboard. And literally, literally, we prayed about everything. And, and he would say, if you have a peace, then it's okay. So if it's in the Bible, or you have a peace, or it's not against the Bible, it's okay. So he taught us how to connect with God and have, how to have a relationship. And so it was really exciting. And what I was just going to say, I was just going to encourage people, you have something, you have more than, you have something that people need. Some of you are like, I need to be, you know, Bill Johnson or Danny Silk. It's like, no, you just need to be yourself. And I guarantee you, it's just when you build a relationship with somebody, when a discipling relationship, it's amazing how the Lord will just use you as a channel, as a funnel. And he'll just funnel wisdom through you. And you'll find yourself saying things to pe- uh, the people that you're discipling that you didn't even know you knew. Yeah. In fact, you didn't know. <laughs> you didn't know it before you shared it. And, and that was our life with art. So then we had our little house on the prairie vision. You want to tell about that? Are we going too slow? No, I think we're okay. You know, that was one of the things that Chris and I used to talk about all the time before we were married. After we were engaged, it's like, you know, he's a dreamer, but then I was a real dreamer. And it's like, I just just want to live out in the woods somewhere, and I want to have some property and some animals and, and raise a family and and you know it was like dream on I was living in the Bay Area in a track home and far from anything that I had ever had in my mind but yet God had placed something inside my heart and Chris had, Chris had, had a um, he was managing a service uh, a service repair station and he had lots of employees below him and he was really young and he's real driven and even back there he was really driven he was um, very slightly driven he was a great he was a great worker he was a great provider but he he lived off of caffeine and candy bars literally it's what kept him going caffeine and candy bars so much to where his body kind of gave out and he ended up having um I crashed he crashed. He had a nervous breakdown that lasted about three and a half years. Now, Chris and I had just gotten married. We, we, we'd only been married a year when this happened. I ended up getting pregnant um, about probably seven months after we got married. And I was sicker than sick could be. On the strongest medication they could give me, I was still getting Growing sick up. about... I wasn't going to say that because you always look oh. gross. But I was. I was getting sick every 20 minutes until the day I had each one of my kids. So whenever she lost weight to the seventh month. Whenever I would, whenever I would go someplace, I'd, you'd have to plan. Okay, it's going to take this long, and I know where the bathroom is. And so I was, you know, I was going through stuff myself. I was just trying to keep myself together. somewhat together. And he had crashed, and we thought, you know. We had talked about for so long about what we wanted to do, and, and this city life is just, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's, it's not doing us any good, so why don't we just pursue our dreams? So we had gone to Lewiston, California on vacation, and it was like serenity. God is here. We could feel him all over. We thought, this is what we need to do. We need to leave the city. We need to move to Lewiston and start our family here, and then everything is going to be just fine. Yeah, well, in the meantime, we had a baby. And before we had the baby, Kathy told me that we were going to have natural childbirth. And I didn't know there was such thing as unnatural childbirth. I didn't even know how children were born. I know how to make them, but I didn't know how how that all worked. So she said, we have to take a class. I'm like, we have to take a class to have children? Like, did they do that in the Bible? You know, I called Art, I'm like, 
are we supposed to take a class to have children? And he's like, well, we'll do it together. So we took this class called Lamaze, which I didn't realize till later that Lamaze is an ancient Hebrew word for, hey, stupid, what the heck are you doing in here? It has nothing to do with childbirth whatsoever. And so we watched all these terrible movies for 12 months, like, I mean, 12 weeks, 12 weeks, 12 months. We had a long birth. We had a long pregnancy. So we watched these movies for 12 weeks, I think. And we, we, the whole, basically, you, you, you become your wife's, wife's, your wife, you only have one. <laughs> your wife needs help <laughs> with breathing and she needs a focal point. So they taught us how to put a focal point up and how to help her coach her breathing and all this stuff. And so she has, we, we, we had a couple of false starts and finally we get to the hospital and we're in the hospital and, and that night there was like 30 women having children in the hospital, like the most they'd had in, I don't know, they said. But so we're in this other room waiting to, for, the, for something to happen and she has a 28 hour labor. And about eight hours, we, had a, we put a Snickers bar up for a focal point. He put a Snickers bar up for a focal point. I put a Snickers bar up for a focal point. And about eight hours into the labor, she was screaming so bad, and I ate the focal point. <laughs> that was a true story. And we finally get into the birthing room, like 28 hours into this. You can imagine, 28 hours, just... Uh, and after about eight hours, like she's screaming, there's women all, they're, they're, the hospital was overfull with women having children, so we're screaming everywhere, and yeah, I'm like, I was, I was three and I think a half, that's why I had a nervous breakdown. I was three and a half weeks overdue. Three and a half weeks overdue. They don't even, they don't even do that anymore. And not only was they it three and a half, they don't do that anymore? No, they would oh. never let you go three and a half what weeks overdue. What would they do? Do a C-section. Oh, C-section. So anyway, <laughs> we were natural. And she didn't want any medication or anything for about the first four hours. She was like, we're going to be okay. I didn't and then take she's like, any. Yes, you did. I did not. You were so drugged. I <laughs> did not. Look into my eyes. You were drugged. I did not. <laughs> yes. Yes. I didn't take so any So we drugs. get into the birthing room. We get Perfectly into the birthing natural room. natural birth. And I have this problem that I pass out when I see blood. You probably needed I to take I kept passing something. out. I kept passing out, and the doctor thought it was his job to, keep, to deliver the baby and keep me awake, which I was good at passing out. So he kept putting smelling salts, and I'd wake up, and, and finally they put her in, and I won't even tell you this, like, you haven't, it's ridiculous, like, I've seen cows born before, but this is much worse. So... Finally, they had to actually take salad tongs and put them up in there and turn the baby around. It was so bad. They finally, the baby comes out and, and the nurse leans over and I am of white as a ghost. It's, I mean, I haven't slept in, you know, 28 hours at least. And she's been screaming for 20. I ate the Snickers bars, the last thing I ate. Poor baby. I know. Good thing. Good thing our focal point was in a bar of soap, because I would have ate that. And so the nurse looks over at me, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm like, what, am I 20 or something? I mean, she, she, she goes, do you want to cut the cord? I didn't even know there was a cord. I didn't watch any of those movies. I was like this, the whole Lamaze class thing. I said, what the heck did we pay you for? That's what I said. So she cuts the cord, and she hands me this baby. It looked like it had been in a car wreck. There was blood everywhere. I'm serious. I'm like, <laughs> you can imagine. I was like, <laughs> I said, man, <laughs> conception was fun, but labor is a problem. I said, no, I waited nine months for this. You can I wait 15 minutes while you clean her up. I really did say that, huh? Really 
Pops, you was an ugly baby. <laughs> no, 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 don't cry. <laughs> Well, I mean, she's beautiful now. It's just like miracles still happen. It's like. Chris? What? Well, she looked like she'd been in a car accident. You try staying in there for nine I months know, and then plus all... another three and a half weeks. Got her out and she had a big hematoma on one side from the cell at Tongs. And oh. it was, she was all squished up. My mom brings her, we bring her out to my mom who'd been waiting, you know, day and a half. My mom looks at her and goes, she looks just like you. <laughs> Serious. That was my mom's first comment. So then we moved to Lewiston. So that all happens. And we moved to Lewiston. And, and, and I buy this house. Kathy doesn't see the house. I buy it. <laughs> I just go and buy the house. I go, bought us a house. She's like, Women, can you believe that I, know, I did that? I know. Or did you? I let him pick out our house all by himself. I picked it out. It was like, it was really, it was a good house. Let me tell you, let me tell you about the house. <laughs> Quickly. When we, <laughs> we packed up, we, we sold our house, we put our house up on the market. Three days it sold. By the end of the month, we were out of there. We had Jamie, who was four months old, a cat that just had kittens, and she bailed on us and left us with six kittens that were two days old. Jumped out the window, knocked the back window out of the truck while we were driving. And we looked like the Beverly Hillbillies moving up into the mountains. Worse. Probably. <laughs> so, here I am. I am so excited to see this new house that Chris bought for me. I'll give you some music. Keep going. Blah, blah, blah. When we got to the house, it was like probably three in the morning, maybe four in the morning, because we, we drove all night to get there. It took a while. And so Chris, Chris said, you know, we have some sleeping bags. Let's just put them on the floor, and then in the morning, we'll, we'll unload the truck. And I was so excited. In the morning, I could not believe this. I wake up. There are spiders crawling on me. There's a spider on Jamie. And I look around the house, and this is the most filthiest house I've ever We shoveled the seen. dirt out with a shovel. We did. So anyway, that was our beginning. We did. And, um, we, and then we, we hit our first winter, and we, I went in and turned the thermostat on in the, <laughs> in the front room, and we were freezing. It was so freezing, you could see your breath in the house, and we were totally freezing. And I'm like, I'm going to call tomorrow. We're gonna, when, as soon as it's morning, I'm going to call and find out why our heater doesn't work. And, and in the morning, our neighbor comes over, who's a mountain man. He's like six foot four, long hair. I mean, he looks like, you know, he, he looks like he, Grizzly Adams. And he comes over, and he goes, hey, neighbor, because we'd met him when we were unloading. I'm like, yeah, he goes, aren't you guys freezing in there? I don't see any wood. I don't see any, anything coming from your, wood, from your uh, fire wood stove. And I'm like, well, I'll turn the thermostat on, and nothing happened. <laughs> He's like, thermostat? <laughs> you don't even have a heater. How would you have a thermostat? So we didn't know it, but the, all we have is a thermostat and no heater. No one ever actually put the heater in there. So we went and cut down a tree. And <laughs> anyway, fast forward. Those were the, and, and then Kathy wanted a horse, so I bought her a horse. Yep. yep. That was really cool, except for the horse couldn't be ridden. He bought me a two-year-old. Oh, uh, didn't know. It's a horse. Two-year-old. It looked like Mr. Ed, so I bought her a horse, and I built a corral. You did. And within a month, the horse ate the corral. <laughs> did it eat the corral? It did. It I ate finally, the corral, and it took off running, and she's finally got this seven horse months pregnant. halter broke. But, yeah, it's And broke. I went, huh? Well, something went broke. So I went to I went to take to change the holder from one lead rope to another one, and she took off, and she took off running towards the road, and here I am, like seven and a half months pregnant with Shannon, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs for my neighbor, help, help, help! In the winter. In the winter, there was snow on the road, and I'm running, holding my belly, trying to chase this horse going towards the. It was crazy. I yeah. could not. So we got it rid of the horse. It ate the barn. It was cheap to feed. This horse didn't like hay. It, it liked anything you built. When you get done building it, it would just eat it. It was something, it was retarded. It's a, a mentally retarded horse. Anyway. 
So we moved from Lewiston finally. Not because of the horse. No. Well, there was not a lot left to live in when the horse got done. <laughs> <laughs> that part's not true. Remember the bats? And we had bats. In the house. In the house. And we, mm. we kill them with a, with a tennis racket. They work really well. Well, how would you kill the bats? And when you hit them, they go, eh! <laughs> 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 Kathy's all the first day, she's like, there's a bird in the house. I'm like, really? And so, yeah, she goes, I flip on the lights, and there's a bird that's at night. And I'm like, I ain't no bird, that's a bat. There's bats in the house. So we had bats the whole time we lived there. And we learned about three months into it that you hit them with a tennis racket. It works really good. It got to be a sport. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> and so then... Oh, remember the fishing? Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. We were, we were so broke. We barely had enough money to get into the house. And so we... Chris bought two fishing poles, and we had Jamie. By then, she was about, I don't know, maybe a little over a year. And we would go fishing, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Actually, we didn't go fishing at lunch. We went fishing at breakfast and dinner all summer long because we had no money, and that's what we ended up eating was fish. Mm -hmm. And it would just so happen to be that they, they planted they, they planted all these like pan-sized trout. Thankfully, we didn't know how to fish, so these were stupid fish, too. It was like... We had a stupid horse, <laughs> and we caught stupid fish. It was like fishing at Frontier Village. You, you didn't have to put anything on the hook. hook. You just throw it in there, and it... It was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. We were doing our little house on the prairie. We thing. were doing our little house on the prairie. Like, it isn't all what it's cut out to be. <laughs> yes. So then we fat, we'll, we'll just tell them a little bit more of the story, and then we'll do this another night. Okay. But then we, um, we didn't have Art and Kathy in our lives for a year, which was our spiritual parents. So we were new Christians. We were like two years old in the Lord, and we were lost. We were totally lost, because they were daily in our lives, and we were... We'd never live without a spiritual father, you know. We were two years old in the Lord, no spiritual parents, and, and I would literally cry. I would cry, say, Lord, you need to give me a spiritual father. So one day I'm working on this green Jeep. I'm working in a repair shop, and I'm working on this green Jeep, and I'm laying on, this, on the creeper, and I'm literally, there's tears running down my eyes, and we had lived a whole year without any leadership in our life, which we had never done in our, we had never done in our Christian walk. And so I was, I, was, I, just, I was laying in there, and I was working on a car, and I was crying. You need to give me a spiritual father. And as clear as day, not audible, but the Lord said, the man who owns this Jeep will be your father. I'm like, I hope he's a Christian. Because <laughs> I had never met him before. So I get out from the Jeep, and it has a fish sticker on the back. I'm like, well, that's a good sign. At least the, you know, at least the car's saved. <laughs> so... So um, at the end of the day, I was so excited. I wonder, like, who owns this Jeep? And so, because one of the other guys had taken it in. So when, when, I was, when we were all done, at the end of the day, the man came to pick up the Jeep. And I told my boss, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll collect the, the bill. And so I go out there, and it's, uh, it's um, a man, probably 15 years my senior. His name was Bill Derryberry. Derryberry. I'm like, well, it sounds a little bean. But whatever. The Lord said, the man who owns this Jeep will be my father. So I'm really nervous. Like, my first date kind of nervous and I'm like you know I'm thinking uh, I'm hope he says Jesus because I want to make sure he's at least a Christian and he seemed really happy and I'm like he seems happy so he's either an alcoholic or he's a Christian <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I give him the bill and we talk and all that and, and we, you know he talks quite a while and he gets in the Jeep and I'm thinking well I'll walk him out to the Jeep so I walk him out to the Jeep and you know, I'm sure, like, looking back, it was really like, I wonder what he's, he's probably thinking, what is he walking me out of the Jeep for? So I walk him out there, and he's, and he's got his window down, and we're talking, and I'm trying to make small talk. I can't think, you know, when you're nervous. Like, I can't, you can't think, and so I can't really think, and I run out of things to say. And so he's like, well, you know, have a great day. It was great meeting you. And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, it was great meeting. Yeah, it was great meeting you, too. And, and I'm thinking, what if he doesn't come back, you know? So... He, he rolls up his window, and I'm like, oh, I'm standing there. So I think, well, I can't let him go. This isn't good. So I pound on the window. He rolls this window down, and I said, I know this sounds kind of weird, but now i got tears rolling down my eyes. <laughs> and I, uh, a voice told me this morning that the man who owns this Jeep will be my father. <laughs> I literally don't know if he's a Christian yet. 
And he's like, he turns off his Jeep and he opens the door and gets out and puts his arms around me. And he goes, I would love to be your father. And I'm like, are you a Christian? <laughs> and so he became our first spiritual father. And this is before we met Bill. And he became our first spiritual father and had input into our life. And it was really, he was great for us. Mm -hmm. And one day he called and asked where I was. Remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell that story, and we'll, we'll, we're going we're gonna to probably end about now. Close. He, he, he called me one day, and he said, Hey, where's Chris? And I said, Oh, he's, he, he went to Reading. Went to Reading? What did he go to Reading for? Oh, I don't know. He was just bored. So he went to Reading. What, where, where is he in Reading? Um, well, I, I think he was going to go look at Jeeps. He, he's, he mentioned Jeeps. And he goes, Jeeps? He goes, he doesn't need a car. What does he need a car for? I said, I don't know, Bill. He just said he was bored and he was going to go down to Reading and look at a Jeep. So Chris or Bill said, so what Jeep dealer is he at? And so I gave him the name of the place and hung up and I thought, oh, he's in trouble. So I'm at the Jeep dealer in Reading. We're living in Weirville and I hear over the loudspeaker, Chris Valentin to the phone, please. Chris Valentin to the phone. I'm like, who could that be? There's only one person that knows where I'm at. So I, you know, I kind of run to the phone. I'm thinking, well, there must be something wrong at home. And I pick up the phone, and it's Bill Derryberry. He goes, hello, this is Bill. I'm like, uh, yeah, where are you at? <laughs> she just called, so you know where I'm at. <laughs> um, I'm at the Jeep dealer. What are you doing there? Um, he's like, you don't need a Jeep. Get home. No, he goes, get your butt home. Bye. And hangs up on me. I'm like, you can't tell me what to do. I'm going home. <laughs> so that was kind of our relationship with Bill. He was very much what we needed. People might call that control, but I call it good fathering. We, he never controlled us, but he always was um, really good about sharing his opinion. And, and, and this is the kind of relationship we had. If I wasn't treating Kathy good, what would you tell me? I'm going to call Bill. <laughs> if I was being a jerk, she'd go, I'm going to call Bill. and He's going to come over and talk to you. <laughs> I'd be like, would you forgive me? That didn't hardly ever happen. No, no six or 12 times <laughs> a year. No. no. But if I was ever online, you would talk to Bill. Then Bill would talk to me. No, I just have to mention his name. It's kind of like, what, why is what you do to your kids? Wait till dad gets home. Just mentioning dad's name. No, actually, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to take care of it before. Not, yeah, not push it on dad. Love and logic. But that was before love and we logic We didn't have came, love and logic so. in those days. We just had a wood spoon and a Bible. That was him. No, that was a good tool. And uh, we met Bill and Benny a year after we were... We were in Weaverville, mm -hmm. and Bill came to our little church of about 40 or 50 people, and he was like, uh, him and Benny were like, they were like recovering hippies, or, <laughs> well, they didn't do drugs or anything, they were like Jesus people, long hair, and, <laughs> and you know, Bill was, Bill was cool, and, and, and he liked us, and it was kind of cool, and, and he'd get up and preach to our church of 40 or 50 people, and was like, we... I remember saying to Kathy, is he reading the same Bible? Like, where does he get this stuff? <laughs> it was amazing. Our little church went from like, I don't know how many it was actually, like 50 probably on an average Sunday, to, to packed. Packed to the walls. Well, it wasn't very big. It only held like 120 people. But within about a year, something like that, a year, it was packed to the walls. And Bill was, uh, he was, he was our hero. He's still our hero, actually. Then I had two spiritual fathers in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was kind of the beginning of our story, the beginning of our life, and we, um, we've really never had a bad day. No, oh, we've had lots of bad days. We've never had a bad day with each other. Bill taught us that you don't let the sun, one of the things that Bill used to say is, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And the way that we interpreted that was, you can be mad at each other, but not for more than one day. So we'd be in bed at night, and if we were mad at each other, we'd have to talk till we fell asleep, till we brought closure. So sometimes the sun would be going up, I'm like, oh, the sun went down, and now it's coming up. 
we've dissipated Bill Johnson. And we, the sun's going up on our anger. But we would lay in bed at night and talk through our, str- our struggles. And so we, we kept short accounts. We did. We, we, we really, we've, Chris and I have always had an awesome, we've been blessed with an awesome relationship. And, you know, I just want to close with this. We've, we've gone through a lot of hard times. You know, a lot of times people will look at leaders of churches and, and the eldership or whoever, and you can look at them and think, man, they have their lives all together. We, we do. We're pretty together. And it could be like, you know what? They, they've never had a hard day in their life. And I think the one thing that I've learned through life is that you can take any situation, no matter what it is, and we've gone through some pretty hard times and moments, but it all, you know, you have a choice of what you do during that time. You can either, you can either give in to the problem and you can let the enemy pull you into it, or you can rise above and say, I have authority over, over this. And you can make something, you can make something good out of anything. And I think that's one of the biggest things that, that I've learned. You gotta tell one story before we then, because you brought that up. We were really, 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 really broke and it was winter time. Oh, and no. Kathy's pretty frugal. No, Kathy's frugal. <clears throat> and so um, one day I come home early from work, which I rarely do. I come home early for work. And all the lights are completely out in my house. And I'm like, that's really weird because it's winter time and it's like completely dark in my house. And so I walk in the house and there's these tents, these little pub tents all over my house, inside my house. And it's completely, well, it's not completely freezing there. There's a wood fire going, but it's freezing in there. There's no lights at all. And as soon as Kathy sees me, she's like, you're early. I'm like, yeah, is everything okay? Yeah, yeah. And she's running out to the front deck where our main switch for our electricity is. And I find out that for months, she's been turning off the main switch in our electricity because things were tight and we didn't have money. So instead of complaining, she just made it fun for the kids. And she said, we're camping indoors. So they had little candles. We had our wood stove. We had our, I had my great grandmother's cast iron pot. So we had cook on the stove <laughs> we cook on the stove we had hurricane lanterns so we had all the light we needed and the blankets and so we just pretended like we were camping you um, know the kids have yes go ahead the kids have some of the greatest memories because of being in hard times but not allowing us to stay in those hard times because mentally i never i never felt like we were poor i felt like we were really rich and I felt like God gave us a creative mind to be able to do things with and to make the best out of situations that may not be very easy to go through. And I was like, you know what? It's just like, what is your focus? You know, what are, what are you looking at? What are you focusing on? Are you looking at the problem? Are you looking at the possibilities? And I just learned that, you know what? I can look at the possibility in anything. I can see something and I can look past the ugliness of it and find something inside of it. And you guys can do the same thing too. Everybody's been given that gift to be able to look inside of something. It's like, you just, it's a choice. It's a choice of, you know, are we gonna stay in a place where the enemy beats us up and attacks our mind? Or are we gonna rise above that and say, you know what? You no, know, God is bigger than what's in front of me. God is bigger than this. And I can find the gold that's hidden inside of, of the, the treasure that he's placed there. And, we, we've had some great memories of, oh, crazy times where it would look like it would be pretty bleak, but yet that's really where most of my most fondest memories come from with my kids growing up and my husband is in the hard times and how we just persevered through it and watching what the Lord did with it all. Yeah, and I want to uh, say this is that um, <clears throat> two people in my life never complain. Kathy and Bill Johnson. I complain. (coughs) Kathy always finds the best in any situation. It doesn't matter what we're going through, and I mean this is the truth. It doesn't matter what we're going through, she always figures out some way to make lemonade out of lemons. Always. 
and no matter what we were going through, or if it was a bad decision that I made, sometimes we were broke because of a decision that I, that I would make. She'd never complain. She'd never blame me. She would never be angry. She would just figure out how to make the best out of a tough situation. And um, we lost, one time we lost our cars, got repossessed. Another time we lost our house and all of our businesses and ended up living in a little apartment here. And I think our was our only car, a little Ford Courier that someone gave us. And never, not one time, did she ever say, well, if you wouldn't have, well, if you would have, well, you, we should have, or it would just like, oh, you know what, we're going to live in an apartment. We're gonna, it's going to be fun. We're going to live in an apartment, and we don't have to mow the lawn, and we have a pool now. Um, that's exactly what she'd be saying as we're moving out of the house that we built for our kids that we had to give to the bank. And as we're driving down the road, she's telling me how excited she's going to be to live in a place that had a pool and we didn't have to do yard work. I'm telling you the truth. This is the way this woman has lived her whole life. Sometimes I think it's good. I was thinking last night, you know, when you're a speaker in a place like this, people honor you. They're like, you're amazing. I read your books or whatever they say. They always think you're something. And I think, you know, um, it's easy to believe in people when positive things are happening through them. But your real friends are made in the silent times of your life. And the real friends, your real friends are the people when you're not successful or you've made really bad decisions or you haven't quite figured out who you are or what you're doing and someone says, I believe in you and they don't just say it, they actually act like they believe in you. And I think the most powerful thing, the most powerful thing I've ever learned in my life is that Jesus is Lord. And I don't say that as a, like some kind of spiritual saying. I mean, when the Lord came into my life, into our lives, he completely, totally transformed our lives. We weren't drug addicts. I had never drank, never smoked. But when the Lord came into my life, you know, we, we kind of look at those things like, well, if you're a drug addict and the Lord comes in your life and he changed, you know, but the Lord changed me as dramatically as he would have changed a heroin addict. I mean, the way my, my mind changed completely. And I had an incredible, we both had this incredible hunger for God that we didn't make happen. It, it was supernatural in us. No one made us serve God. We did it because we wanted to. We loved church. I think um, we probably miss more church now than we ever had in our lives. But for 20 years, I don't think we missed 10 Sundays. We would look forward. Like if it was Thursday, it's like Sunday's coming. Our favorite day of the week. I remember when my kids were teenagers, they'd say, do we have to go to church? i go, no, you get to. You get to go to church. It's a privilege. And we live like that our whole lives. And um, I was going to, where was I going? I was going to say that um, I think the second most powerful thing I learned in my life besides Jesus is Lord and he saves our souls is that I feel like I changed when I believed in Jesus and I changed when people believed in me. Those are the two most powerful things that ever happened in my life. I had dramatic change when Jesus came into my life and he, and he saved me and I believed in him. But the second most dramatic change happened when people believed in me. When Kathy believed in me and Bill believed in me and, and Danny, he was just a youngster then, those days. But um, something powerful happens when you believe in people. And I want to say this, it's really easy to believe in people when they look successful. It's much harder to believe in people when they're more in their raw form. And I, I don't know if I'm ever not in a raw form, but... <laughs> <laughs> People were like, you're a diamond in a rough. I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get polished, but it's a, uh, and I just want to encourage you, like, I felt like it was important tonight just to, I, I just didn't feel like I was supposed to preach. I felt like it was so important just to hear a little bit of our story in our history, because 
we're talking about women. I've been talking about women for months, you know, for two months. I've been teaching about women. And, you know, people are like, I mean, they think I'm making some theological statement. And I would really like to just go, hey, come up here and tell them why I'm teaching this stuff. Because if you knew the people that we are married to, you would understand how we have any platform at all. And um, if it wasn't for my wife and for a few friends in my life, I don't know where I'd be, but it definitely wouldn't be leading anybody. And so we're in the gates and I get to brag about you. And, um, and thank you for listening. And why don't you, anybody who's struggling in their marriage, why don't you just stand up? Can we just pray for you? I, I don't know, if you, if you don't want to stand, that's okay. But if you, if you want help, if you want to stand, would you just stand and, and we're just going to pray for you. We, we've had a lot of failures in our life, but our marriage is always not, is not one of them. Like, we've had a great marriage. I, I think we have authority to actually impart something tonight. So if you're struggling in your marriage, why don't you just stand and, and just let us just pray for you. We're just going to pray for you right from here. Is there anyone else? I know it might take some courage. I don't mean your marriage is, you know, that you're getting divorced or marriage is on a rocks or anything. I just, you're struggling. You're going through a tough time. Father, I just thank you for just transparency. And Lord, I thank you that you are a God that sees all, that knows all. Lord, you're a God of reconciliation. You're a God of love. And Lord, I thank you, Father, for each one of these people that are standing before yeah. you, Father, with their hearts open. Lord, I just pray that you would just touch the relationship. Father, each person stands in a different place. Each person has a different story. But Lord, you have the answer. You are the answer. Yeah. And Jesus, I just pray right now that you would just touch every person in every place, in every home. Lord, that you would bring restoration back into their marriage. Yeah. Father, that you would rekindle that love again. Yeah. Father, let it be like the first time they laid eyes on one another when they said, oh my goodness. Father, kindle that passion. Rekindle that passion, Father. Stir up the embers. Father, and for people who maybe have started their marriage on a rocky foundation, yeah. Lord, I just pray that you would gird up that relationship, that you would gird up that foundation. Yeah. Lord, that today is a new day. And it doesn't matter who is right. It doesn't matter who is wrong. Father, it just matters that this relationship gets founded again yeah. on you. Yeah. And so, Jesus, I just pray in your name, Father, restoration over each one of these lives, each one of these homes. Yeah, Lord, we just release a spirit of reconciliation, yeah. something we can't even do, something maybe I uh, just have a sense that, that I feel like there's a sense of hopelessness. I think Danny prayed for that this morning, or we prayed for that this morning. But in marriage, I, I feel like Sometimes you get this place where you both tried and it just isn't working. And so you need, you really need a miracle, like almost like a physical healing, like you need a miracle. And Lord, we just release that over people and people are watching by iBethel TV. Lord, we just release a miracle of reconciliation into the lives of people. Lord, that you would, that you would uproot bitterness and, and hatred and brokenness and offense and, and, and dysfunctional upbringing and all the stuff that we've dealt with, that Kathy and I dealt with in our own lives, and Lord, that you would bring along, that you would bring to these folks fathers and mothers, that they wouldn't just be Christians, that they would be disciples, that people could speak into their lives and could help mold them and direct them and even correct them. Father, we pray that you would just release in them a healthy culture around them that could model, like Paul said, um, imitate me as I imitate Christ, that there would be people that they could imitate their marriage like we imitated Bill and Benny, like we imitated Bill Derryberry and Judy Derryberry. Lord, that there would be model, there would be model marriages that these people who are struggling could look at and say, this is how they're dealing with 
their issues. This is how they're dealing with their children. This is how they deal with offense. Lord, I, just, I pray that you would just release in their lives people who could actually shepherd them into the, into the green pastures uh, of peaceful, loving, beautiful relationships in Jesus' name. Let this be the season of reconciliation. And even as we're praying, as Kathy and I are praying tonight, I just saw hope coming into people. Like, you know, uh, that proverb we read, 31, where it says, and her lamp does not go out at night. I saw like the Lord just lighting a lamp in your lives. Like it's gone out. Like it's night and you're like, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. I feel lost. I feel directionless. I feel hopeless. I feel like we can't go on. I don't know what to do. And I just saw the Lord just lighting this lamp in the middle of your night. And uh, it's not true that the Lord is the, the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I, I really don't like that saying at all. And it isn't even biblical. The Lord is the light in the tunnel. He's with you in any dark place. And Lord, we just release that to people right now, that they would experience the real presence of God, the way that, the way that we have in, in hard times, especially the way you've come to us and you've comforted us in, in hard times with our kids and with our finances and all the hell we've been through in our lives. God, thank you that you were in the midst of our hard time. You weren't waiting for us to, to get out of it to, so that you could love us, but you loved us in our hard times. You sent people to us in our hard times. You gave us money in hard times. Lord, you gave us wisdom in hard times. And in really hard times, you gave us hope that this, time, this season would be, it would end. And Lord, we just give people hope that this season you're in, it will end. It's not forever. I'm telling you, I don't care what you're thinking, it's not forever. You will pass through it. There is a valley of shadow of death, but it's not your whole life. And Lord, we just release people who are in that, in that valley of the shadow of death, we release them from this. If there's a shadow, there's a light. Right. Father, we just remind them that there can't be a shadow without a light. And Lord, we just release the light of God into their life. That You're under the wings of God. You're hiding in the, in the shadow of his wings. And Lord, we just release that to every person who's in some kind of a situation that would make them hopeless or or make the and even people who aren't standing. Maybe it's not marriage problems, but you're just in a hopeless situation. We prayed for it this morning, but I feel so profound, so powerfully tonight that we're to pray for it again. If you're in a hopeless situation, in fact, I'm sorry to delay this, but I, I just need you to stand up. If you're in any, any kind of hopeless situation, you know who you are. I feel so powerfully tonight that, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I know that when we prayed for something and we believe that, you just don't keep praying and praying. But then there's Luke 18 where Jesus just keeps telling us, knock, keep knocking, just keep pressing in, keep, keep asking, keep seeking. And, and uh, this morning we knocked, and, and maybe we're just supposed to knock again. I just feel so overwhelmed with a sense of, of people's hopelessness. And I just feel like we're supposed to do something about it. Lord, I just release that over every person who's standing. There's people watching by TV that are just, this is stuck. Yeah, we know what it means to be stuck. We know what it means to wake up and want to pull the covers over your head and just pray for another day. Just pray for a new day. We just don't want to give up, get up today. We just want this day to go. We know what it's like to feel like you're living in a nightmare. We've, we've done that too. We've done, and I, I can't say we've done everything, but we've done some hard stuff. I feel just so overcome with people's pain. That's good, because Jesus is always moved by compassion. Holy Spirit, we just know that Jesus is in the room right now, just moving with compassion over people. We pray for these hopeless situations. We know, Lord, they're, they're hopeless to us. They're not hopeless to you at all. <laughs> you are the light in the midst of darkness. You're, you're the help. That David said this, you're a very present help in a time of trouble. <laughs> He said, you're the tower I run into and I'm safe. <laughs> just picture that. <laughs> God, I just pray right now that you would be that to people. Whatever it is, provision, 
the money's really tight for people. Boy, we know that so well. We've gone so long without finances at times. We just don't even know how we got from week to week. But Lord, we just release finances on people. It would come miraculously. Crazy stuff would happen to us. People would leave groceries and people would pay our electric bill. And I mean, people who didn't even know us would just give us money. Just out of the blue, we'd walk through a store and someone would hand us money. Crazy things would happen. We didn't even know how it would come most of the time. We just, but I can tell you that we would just, we'd just say to one another, we're just going to trust God. If I was down, she'd say, we're going to trust God. If she was down, I'd say, we're going to trust God. We're like, yep, that's what we dedicated our life to, and that's what we're going to do. If we die, we're going to die trusting God. <laughs> if I'm going to die, I'm going to die trusting God. I'd rather die in faith than live in doubt. Lord, we just release that over people right now, that you would give them supernatural faith for their situation, a gift of faith, that they would leave here and like, has something changed me? You know what? We're coming out. We're getting out of this situation. We're getting out of this problem. Our kids are coming home. We're reconciling. Our marriage is going to be okay. Money's coming. We're going to get a job. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. A prophetic guy said something's going to happen, and I believe it. It's going to happen. I just believe that. I get paid to know this stuff, you know? Lord, I just, re I just release that. Something's about to happen over people right now. Something positive is about to happen over people. You know, that's what, when you live in a curse, you, you're, you always feel like something bad's about to happen. But when you live in a blessing, you don't know what it is, but you just have this anticipation, like, something good's about to happen to us. How do you know that? I have no facts. I can just feel it. I can feel it in my feeler. Like, something good's about to happen. And I have this sense, like, just as we're praying, like, something shifted just a minute ago. Like, something good's about to happen for you guys that are standing, that people that are... Are, are pulling on this prayer like something's of good is about to happen I don't know what's going to be but something's going to happen and Lord I just released that you got something? Yeah. yeah I do I can remember a time when we were um, just in the midst of everything that we were going through and the Lord came and visited me and he said I'm going to give you 21 days of miracles and I'm like 21 days of miracles I'm like okay but he said but you're going to have to look for them and he began to teach me that so many times when we're asking the Lord for a miracle, when we're asking him for an intervention or something to happen, we're expecting the obvious, like something just to blow up in front of our face. And so many times that's not how the Lord is working. Yep. He's working in the small, still things and the things where you have to actually seek after him, you have to look for them. It's really easy to, to pass by those things. And so I'm just prophesying that same thing, that 21 days of miracles. 21 days of miracles and I just want to challenge you if you don't have a journal to get something that you can begin to journal these miracles down in because I still have I still have the one that yeah. I wrote and I can go back through it and I can say oh my goodness the transient that you brought in front of our parts store that had no that was filthy dirty that had broken glasses we had no money to feed him but yet we bought him something he ended up being an electrician just at the moment where we needed some electrical work done and we were able to take him in and do some things for him and, and he did some stuff for us and that would have been a really easy one just to have turned our head and said no thank you but the Lord said no I brought I brought this miracle in this form and it was just one thing like that after another after another after another so just be aware 21 days of miracles but be looking for the miracle Amen that's a good word. 